everyone, my name is Sarah, and although I'm here as a delegate from Sambi in Cape Town, I'm presenting some of my master's research that I did while I was at WITS, and I submitted at the beginning of last year. And I think um, a lot of what I have to say is related to what Becca, I'm not sure if he's here, was speaking about in KZN yesterday, about the confusion between the different institutions on a local level, and I think I hope today to leave you with a sense of how complicated these situations are in terms of management and the trade-offs that are involved in them. So, to give you some background, Bushback Ridge is in northern Mpumalanga. This is Kruger National Park in the east. This is Bushback Ridge. Nelspruit, White River, and Hoodspruit are there. And um, Bushback Ridge local municipality falls within the boundaries of the former homeland Gazankulu. And because of this, all of the villages here are characterized by high population densities, low economic development, poor infrastructure, low education levels, high unemployment and poverty. And because of this, many households remain heavily, heavily dependent on natural resources, both for income generation and for domestic use. And one of these is firewood, which is the focus of my study. So firewood, as has been explained by a few people here today, and is extensively used in a lot of Africa and in, and in Bushback Ridge. It's a cheap energy source that is mainly collected from the communal lands or the communal felt surrounding village settlements. And because of this, its cheapness, essentially, it remains extensively used despite many households have access, having access to electricity. And this is quite an important point in this area. And because of this extensive use, many have raised concerns over the sustainability of the firewood resource, where a lot of residents have said that they are traveling longer distances to find firewood, they are taking longer time, a greater proportion of households admit to buying firewood, and a greater proportion of residents are cutting livewood. And this is, last point is particularly important because it's actually prohibited by traditional laws to cut live trees for firewood. The expectation is that the wood that you use for fires is dead wood that is just lying around. And all of this, the situation is particularly problematic because it's all underpinned by the acknowledgement that there's been reduced local regulation over the past 20 years of firewood harvesting. And this I found particularly intriguing and I decided to pursue this aspect of firewood harvesting for my masters. So to give you some background, oh, it's gone a bit skew here, sorry. So we have the apartheid government. There are some differences between then and now. During apartheid, the government used traditional authorities and, and specifically the chiefs to implement a system of firewood regulation through laws such as not allowing people to cut live trees they did this by giving the chiefs money and a budget to send patrolmen out who then canvassed the communal lands and apprehended any offenders. These offenders were then brought before the tribal court and if they were found guilty were issued with a fine or had to complete community service. And in this way it was quite an effective system at regulating the amount of firewood that was being harvested. But um, in 1994 we got democracy, yay! <laughs> um, and with this, a lot of things changed in terms of the way that uh, local governance was carried out. And I'm gonna highlight three ways that are particularly crucial to natural resource regulation. So firstly, was the implementation or institution of local governance structures. And I've highlighted here the role of the ward councils and the ward council community development forums, which are village level structures, where there are representatives from different organizations and they come together and they try and drive village development. And above the ward council is the municipality. And so already we can see that there might be some tension arise, arising between the traditional authorities and the new democratic institutions. The next thing that changed was that the government directed the money that was sent to the chief to these new local democratic structures that meant that the capacity of the chief and his patrolmen to canvas the areas was very much reduced. 
And the third change was that it was officially recognized. Natural resource management became officially recognized as the municipality's role and not that of the chief anymore. However, firewood remains absent in the environmental portfolio of the municipality. And so what happens here, oh, all my shapes have gone off, I mean, sorry. Institutional gap, an institutional gap has arisen between the traditional authorities and the ward councils in terms of firewood harvesting. So who's in charge? Is it the chiefs who have, who have no money? Is it the ward councils who don't see firewood as their problem? What's happening? And this is the, the question that I wanted to pursue, is who is in charge of regulating firewood harvesting? And so the aim of my project was to uncover the roles and responsibilities of the traditional and democratically elected leaders. And I did this by focusing on what the leaders say their roles were and what the community saw their roles were. And I did this by going to six villages um, that fell under two chieftaincies. Um, we've got um, Islington, Burlington, and Cottondale, and New Forest, Arbourstone, and Mary Pebble Stream. And they share similar biophysical and socioeconomic conditions. I conducted five focus groups in each village that were stratified by age and gender, and this was to get community perspectives on their leaders. And then I also did interviews with each of the leaders at the different, at the different levels. So, my first section of results, I asked the focus groups who they saw as the implementer of firewood laws. And along the x-axis we have their responses, and along the y-axis we have the percentage of focus groups citing that response. And clearly, clearly we can see, with over 70% of the focus groups citing the chief as the main implementer of the firewood laws, that already he is seen as a primary institution in this system, with the second being the chief and the Induna combined. Oh, and I forgot to say, for the purposes of this presentation, I've pooled all the responses of the focus groups together. Although there are some village level differences, and by and large they show a similar governance situation. So that's the first sort of indication of where we're going. The next thing I ask is the focus groups to rank the institutions of order in order of importance, with the most importance being given a score of nine to the least, or if they were not acknowledged at all, given a score of zero. I then average these across the focus groups and across the villages, and this is the table that comes up with the institution mean rank score and the range of scores that was generated. So firstly, we can see, once again, the chief had the highest mean rank score where he was consistently cited as either the first or second most important institution in firewood regulation. Next, we see the role of the Nduna or the local village headman he, he got the second highest mean rank score, but interestingly, he shows a higher range of values. And this indicates the village level dynamics that are happening, where the role of the Induna um, differs from village to village. And so in some villages, he was less important than in others. And finally, all these other institutions, the community members themselves, civic association, CDF, provincial and municipal government, they all scored incredibly low, 2.5, 1.8 compared to 8. And so we can already from this see, chief is the most important, an added layer with the, with the um, Induna, where civic government is very low, lowly ranked in importance. Finally, as part of this, um, I asked them each to explicitly describe the roles of the leaders in terms of firewood harvesting, and I clustered these into three categories those that have no responsibility, intermediate or high. No responsibility is pretty self-explanatory. Intermediate suggests that this institution has a role to play, but they fall under the authority of a higher power, such as you can report illegal harvesters to someone else. And high responsibility, you can find you were described as the ultimate authority or you have security that actively patrol. And I sum these across all the focus groups and villages. And as we can see here, these are all the institutions along here. Once again, the chief is 
every single one of his duties fell within the high responsibility category. He could find, he was the ultimate authority, and he has security that actively patrol. And interestingly, no other institution was described as being the ultimate authority in firewood regulation. The next, the highly varied responses of the Induna. Once again, when you break it down into village level, you see that that all the answers cluster out. And so in the villages where he was ranked very poorly, he was given no, he was assigned the no responsibility in firewood regulation. And finally, all the other institutions were mainly described as having no responsibility. So the same, the same ideas are being carried through with the chief as the important, Induna second, but village level differences, and civic government very little responsibility. So, what does this mean? The amount of certainty with which, um, and the amount of consistency with which the chief was described as the ultimate authority tends to indicate that there are some governance systems in place. The chief is most important, the Induna is important on a village level, and the civic government has very little responsibility in firewood regulation. So this is a good thing. It seems to indicate that the gap between in the roles and responsibilities between the democratic structures and the traditional authorities is a lot smaller than what we thought. But the story doesn't end here because when I asked around the actual systems of regulation, so who needs a permit to harvest firewood? How do you go about getting it? And um, how much do you have to pay to get one? What are the firewood laws? What happens if you break the law? All those kind of questions around the system there were a whole host of um, answers that meant that I couldn't even generate tables or graphs because there was so much variety. And so in terms of the system, there seems to be a lot of confusion and a lot of uncertainty about what's going on. And using this and from the discussions held with focus groups, I get the sense that while everybody knows the roles of the institutions, the systems are not being implemented. Um, and it's, just, it's quite dis disheartening to know that these systems are not being implemented. And so I, I wanted to know why that was happening, and so I turned to the leaders, and I asked them what the biggest governance issues they faced were in terms of firewood regulation, and these are the top three responses, with the responses at the bottom and the frequency of these responses along the y-axis. And the third most... Um, important or frequently cited issue was threats to security. So the few patrolmen that they did have were going out into the communal lands and were being attacked or threatened with bewitchment or um, threatened with death by harvesters out in the field, which meant that the patrolmen were then avoiding certain areas out of fear for their lives, which is a big governance issue because how can you regulate something if you can't monitor it. And then the next two are quite interlinked. The biggest governance issues of can't afford electricity and disregard for firewood laws. So while some of the leaders suggested that the communities were just going out and they were just harvesting firewood and they were very reckless and they didn't care about the environment and, and there was a sense of insubordination in terms of the disregard for laws, most of the leaders linked pe communities' disobedience of firewood laws to the fact that they couldn't afford electricity. And so people can't afford electricity, there's no firewood available, they're forced to cut live trees in order to access firewood, and so they're disobeying the law. And it was that kind of theme that ran through a lot of discussions with the leaders. Time and again, they would say, no, but the people are forced to harvest, they have no choice, they can't afford alternatives. And the sense that I got from this was that the leaders might be consciously or actively not implementing the laws because they see that their communities have no choice. They're actively not um, choosing to turn a blind eye to the disobedience and the illegalities of it because they see that their people have no alternatives. And this adds an incredibly important dimension when it comes to management, because 
if we come in as conservation as conservationists and we say, oh, just give them more patrolmen, that, that'll sort the issue out. If the leaders believe that patrolling it won't help the situation, then we're a bit stuck and the situation would be resolved. And so where does that leave us? In conclusion, where does that leave us? We found ourselves in a bit of a catch-22 where the uncontrolled harvesting, like we're seeing in Bushback Ridge, where there are no regulations, where people are harvesting as they will, is compromising the future sustainability of the resource base, resulting in firewood scarcity and resulting yeah, in, in increased firewood, sh firewood shortages. But the alternative of controlled harvesting, bigger regulations and more permits, more patrolmen, the leaders see as limiting people's access to the energy sources that they need now. And so how do we, how, how can we trade off these two massive problems in these situations? And I don't think that these are the only two options. And we need to come up with solutions that address energy security, environmental sustainability, and poverty, and they sit in the sweet center here of this Venn diagram. And I think some situations, I, I would recommend the institution possibly of um, coppice, coppice programs, such as mentioned by Mr. Feldenhays, or rotational harvesting programs. And I would recommend the use of traditional leaders in this sense because they are ready and established um, authority in natural resource regulation. Thank you.